that was amazing. <laughs> okay, but let's start. It's uh, it's a challenging time of the year. Uh, uh, the the season is changing from autumn to uh, to winter, and uh, we see the consequences of uh, of the last uh, storm, and we are still uh, uh, bearing with uh, with um, with the circumstances. Um, hello, my name is Helen Soveli Sepping. I'm uh, I'm vice director for green transition uh, at uh, Tallinn University of Technology. And uh, it is my pleasure that we um, have a book presentation here today in uh, in our university. Uh, it's um, it's a nice uh, joint project that uh, Yoko has been um, uh, has been uh, uh, sort of um, pushing forward uh, for the for the last uh, couple of months and uh, and now your book uh, Gaia uh, Nomad Century is in Estonian. I think it's a it's a lighthouse book for Estonian uh, public because um, we're going to talk about it uh, later. Um, migration is not an issue that we want to touch upon here in Estonia and that's why uh, we um, we should talk about it. Before we give floor to uh, Gaia for um, a short presentation, I would like to give a floor to Yoko and, and make a short intro into how this uh, book came into being in, uh, in Estonia. Why Nomad Century and how, how did you find the book? Oh, thank you, Helen. Thank you for the cooperation. You have been supportive from uh, uh, the fir very first time that I mentioned this book and of course also Gaia it's so nice to see you we haven't actually uh, physically met <laughs> but uh, uh, but almost yesterday we almost were on our way to meet but the climate uh, intervened so we but we are very used to changes actually thanks to the Covid so all bad things have some good sides but this book I actually first of all uh, read about it as an um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, overview from I think Financial Times or The Guardian or something and actually even by that I realized that this book might uh, might be a real game changer and I definitely liked uh, the practicality of it uh, the fact that Gaia is actually offering solutions and doing this in a very brave way but at the same time the book includes so much more and uh, then I actually based on this review only approached the um, uh, British publisher and then everything moved so quickly that uh, I was somehow convinced that that it's the right thing to do to try and bring this to the Estonian audience so I'm really happy and there have been a lot of supporters on the way. It wasn't an easy book to translate. It's sort of on at the at the same time science and poetry. So uh, so it wasn't easy process, but uh, but it's been a really, uh, really interesting process. And I'm really happy that it's ready and I wouldn't like to take more time. So I would like to give the floor to back to you, Gaia. Yes, I'm, I, we are really happy to have you. Thank you. Yes, please. Hello, hello, or Tere, Tere, I think in Estonian, if I've got that right. Um, hi, uh, Yoko, so nice to so nice to meet you virtually like this, and Helen, and um, everybody listening. Um, yes, yeah, so so as we look outside today, it's it's absolutely freezing cold, um, deep snow. Uh, and it can be difficult, perhaps, to remember the kinds of summer that we had and the summer before that, and the fact that that this is this is far from an ordinary time. We've changed. Um, 
if if we look back to July um, this year, we had um, in in the UK, which is which is uh, doesn't normally have the extremes that you get. You get more extremes um, on continental Europe and in in places like Estonia. But we we already had temperatures above forty degrees, um, forty six degrees. Um, we had extreme heat um, in countries across the northern hemisphere this year, from Asia to Africa to um, to the Americas. Um, this is uh, wildfires breaking out in Britain. Um, it looks like Australia. This is this is the US um, suffering terrible drought. Um, in Kentucky, in America, helicopters were rescuing drowning people from floods. Across Europe, the wildflower, there were wildfires. Um, Seville became the first city to actually name a heat wave, um, which is what we do for other extreme events like hurricanes and storms. Um, and they called it heat wave Zoe, a category three. Um, in Italy, the heat caused the collapse of an alpine glacier, killing 11 people. Um, in Africa, there was um, drought, crop failure, famine conditions that are ongoing from Yemen to Mali. Pakistan and India emerged uh, from months of unbearable heat only to be hit by catastrophic floods. Um, afterwards, um, 33 million people were, were displaced in Pakistan in just one week. In Bangladesh, the power and water boards were shut due to flooding. Millions of people were marooned and displaced, seeking safety um, on the roofs of their buildings. Um, there have been hurricanes, um, extreme hurricanes across the southern U US. This is Hurricane Ian, um, devastating parts of Florida um, and the neighboring states. So, you know, this is our world at around 1.3 degrees Celsius hotter than the pre-industrial average. Um, you know, and, and have a look at some of this. Have a look at this because this is the best it's going to be. It's going to get much, much more dangerous as the temperatures rise over the coming decades. So events that we've experienced here are going to become more frequent and more severe. And what it means is that large parts of the world, many of the most populated places um, in Asia, Africa and the Americas are going to become unlivable. Um, so I kind of I wrote this book really out of frustration because um, people are not talking about this. Nomad Century is my book really about what we can do about it. Um, it's a pragmatic book. It's a book of solutions. And the main solution is to use our ancient survival adaptation of migration. So what I'm really proposing is mass migration on an unprecedented scale. And this is pretty extreme. Um, and I'm sure that many of you will be skeptical. So I'm going to explain um, why we need it and how it would work. Um, and before I go any further, I'm just going to double check. Helen, can you actually, can you see my slides? Perfectly. Okay, brilliant. I just thought I'd double check so that I'm not talking into a void because it's hard to know from here. <laughs> okay, so... Um, The problem, of course, is climate change, um, which is getting which is getting worse as our carbon emissions continue to rise. And I'm sure you all know about this. But but what it, what it's doing essentially is greenhouse gases are trapping the heat. That so the sun's heat is is now heating the atmosphere and injecting it with with enormous amounts of energy. And it's this energy that drives these um, much more severe storms heat waves, flooding, ice melt, other extremes. Um, the extreme weather um, that we get, whether it's hot or cold, this, this disruption is, is largely caused by climate change. And it means that weather systems, they kind of sit in one place for a long time. So we get a kind of heat dome and we get these um, freezing cold drought um, conditions in the winter as well. So, so we're getting these extremes. Um, 
Now, if you look at if you look at this, we're currently um, heading. We're charting somewhere between um, 4.5 and 6.0. Are these um, these two pathways at the moment? Thankfully, we've left the 8.5 behind. We're not charting that anymore. These very very scary ones, um, but we're way off. 2.6. So we're somewhere between 4.5 and 6. Um, so we are easily headed for somewhere between 3 and 4 degrees by the end of the century. And what this means um, is that uh, large areas of the globe are going to become um, uninhabitable. And it means that migration is now inevitable. Uh, we're already seeing it. We're already seeing um, um, increased uh, climate migration. Um, um, so so um, there are essentially what I call the four horsemen of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is the, the human dominated era that we're we're currently in. So we've left the sort of relatively stable Holocene period behind. And we're now in this human dominated area, the 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 um the Anthropocene. And the four horsemen of the Anthropocene are heat, drought, fire, and floods. And these are all very dangerous to human life, to wildlife and to property. And they're all going to become much worse over the coming decades. Um, at four degrees, large parts of the globe are affected by high severity impacts and many by multiple ones. And we're already seeing um, the impact of multiple um, impacts in parts of the world, um, especially um, Asia and Africa at the moment, um, where, where what it means is, is people get affected by one severe event, whether it's um, flooding or heat or something, and then straight after, before they have time to kind of build up um, and ad adapt to these changes, another extreme event will hit them. And, and they just don't have the resilience to cope with this. Um, so um, heat. Um, becomes especially hazardous when it's combined with humidity because our bodies can only cope with heat by producing sweat and um, because sweat cools us as it evaporates. But when it's when we get high humidity, our sweat can't evaporate and so we overheat um, and that's deadly. Um, so wet bulb temperatures um, above 35 degrees, which is known as the threshold of survivability, um, that that it will cause even young, fit people to overheat and die within about six hours. Um, now, the thing is, recent studies coming out um, in sort of August and September this year show that that actually that wet bulb temperature might be much, much lower. They reckon that the threshold of survivability um, is probably around a wet bulb temperature of somewhere between 25 and 28, even for young, healthy adults doing minimal activity. And that means that millions more people um, will be at risk from deadly heat sooner than um, scientists uh, predicted originally. Um, some of the deadliest heat waves in the last two decades. Um, in 2003, there was a European heat wave which killed around 30,000 people. And in 2010, a Russian heat wave killed over 55,000 people. But in neither of those two events did um, wet bulb temperatures exceed uh, 28 degrees. So um, even at two degrees, we see that large regions of the world will be impacted by heat stress. Um, this was um, at four degrees. Um, and as you can see, the tropical regions are the most impacted, uh, whereas northern latitudes are much more livable. So essentially, people are going to have to move from large swathes of land around the tropics, places that are going to become too hot, too flood prone, suffering crop failures, droughts. And these are lands across Asia, Africa, the Americas, even parts of southern Europe, um, Australia. And they are collectively home to billions of people. Um, and many of these people are extremely poor and they're already experiencing climate impacts and population displacements. So we are talking about billions of people having to move over the coming decades. 
So some predictions are one and a half billion people just by 2050. Um, it's certainly going to be tens of millions. It's already tens of millions. Um, we're going to see hundreds of millions, potentially billions. Um, and yet nobody is planning for it. So my proposal is um, that we, we stop ignoring this problem and we plan for ways to manage and facilitate this migration um, because it's happening anyway, whether we like it or not. Um, we need to plan it. We need to build a better global society that can manage this um, rather than one that's always in crisis. And the way we manage migration um, can be the solution to many of our crises. So, I mean, I've spent the best part of my career explaining the, the importance of mitigating climate change, of, of preventing our carbon emissions from, um, from increasing and um, increasing the climate problem. Um, and we certainly need to carry on doing that. Um, I've also been talking a lot um, and leaders are now starting to talk a little bit about adaptation, about the need to change everything that we do. Um, to take account of the very different world that we're living in. That means changes to um, our energy systems, our food production systems, our infrastructure, um, how we uh, how we build our houses, the materials we build them out of, all everything. We need to adapt to um, this completely different world. Um, to this hotter, more climatically violent world that we've created. But now I'm also saying we need to wake up to the fact that for some people in some places, there will be no way to adapt. They, these people will have to move. Um, now, I'm just going to give you an example um, of Mumbai, which is um, a city in India where 9 million, there are 22 million people living in, Bar, in Mumbai. Um, 9 million of them live in slums. Um, and this is what they look like. They're sort of, um, they're, they're essentially cramped concrete boxes with um, corrugated metal roofs and they're closely packed together with sort of airless alleyways. And the temperatures in urban slums like these are already between six and 10 degrees hotter than in the rest of the city. Now, can can these people, you know, these nine million people simply adapt to hotter temperatures by everybody installs air conditioning? You know, obviously not. No, um, the energy costs of the little air conditioning that they already have in in the, you know, in the in the big apartments and, and hotels already causes um, power outages, blackouts whenever there's a heat wave. You know, it's it. it it, we cannot, we we absolutely cannot um, just adapt to these hotter temperatures. These people will have to move. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody will move from Mumbai. Um, there are cities that can cope with um, with these extreme conditions. Look at Qatar, look at Dubai. But these are cities where, where um, very few people live. They are completely adapted. They live in essentially air conditioned shopping malls. Um, they're very wealthy and everything they need is brought into them. A population of 22 million people cannot live like that. Um, they have to have small. The, these are small populations. So so, you know, if we are if we wake up and we're honest about what we face, this is not um, this is not going to be possible in a few decades. These people will have to move. So people are going to have to move to um, northern cities, essentially. Um, and in my book, I identify different locations uh, where people will move. Um, in some places, it will mean expansion of existing cities. In other places, it means entirely new cities will have to be built. And it is a big deal. This is a huge, huge upheaval. But this this century we're facing a huge upheaval anyway because climate change is literally everything change whether we plan it or not people will have to move because they have no choice so it's much better to plan um 
Migration, when it is well planned, actually makes excellent economic sense, um, both for the migrants, for the for the um, people in the countries that they leave behind and for the host nations that accept these people. It massively helps rich countries. Um, first of all, um, we are facing a huge demographic crisis in the north where um, in Japan, for example, adults um, diapers, nappies, whatever you call them, um, are already outselling infant ones. Um, but across the Northern Hemisphere and um, most uh, wealthy places, and not just the Northern Hemisphere, actually, we are facing the issue that we're not having enough babies to support an elderly population. And that is um, a big economic problem, um, especially um, as we have these ageing populations. And immigration solves that. But it also benefits um host countries economically as well as of course culturally and socially um, they immigrants create new jobs they increase productivity there are countless studies that show that they do not drive down wages they do not increase unemployment they do not increase crime rates but essentially it does require an investment it requires a financial investment in ensuring that there is um, that we do plan for these cities to be expanded. That means we need um, more housing. We need better access to um, health care, to education, to all of our other um, uh, social systems. And it also very, very crucially requires social investment. We must counter this very poisonous narrative that uh, populist governments um, have uh, have embraced. Um, this anti-migrant narrative. We must counter that um, from kindergarten upwards. It is toxic, it is um, socially divisive, and we must see ourselves as different. We must see our nations as inclusive, expansive places where we can grow. Um, we must talk about this now. I don't want to, I don't want to overstay my time, but this um, idea of keeping people out, this poisonous idea of keeping people out is not, is not the way forward. People will come anyway. We must make it work. And we make it work by creating a vision, a leadership with vision. At the moment, the only long-term vision that I see looking for um for real change is being held by some of the worst autocratic um, leaders, people like Putin have a vision that is a really dangerous um, and deadly vision of um, increased empire. We have Xi, Ping, Xi, Xi Jinping with his um, uh, communist vision looking forward the next five to ten years. Again, it's a really deadly negative vision. We need in our democracies to have a vision of what the next coming decades will look like in a truly green, sustainable, democratic, inclusive, progressive society where we can create productive, productive industries and productive societies. So we have hope and we have hope, our children have hope. Um, you know, the number of young people that come to me um, thinking there is nothing, there is nothing to look forward to except debt and um, terrible climate and environmental problems. That's that's terrible. We need to create a vision of a better society, and it includes it includes the reality of what we face with climate change and pragmatically looking forward. We don't want to build cities like this where um, we, which are very, uh, they're socially. They're socially not inclusive. They're they're very separate. They're very um, environmentally unsustainable. We want to in, we want to create much denser cities where everything is um, where industry, where um, jobs, where um, social spaces, where everything is built into the city. Cities like our older cities, which were built within walking. Everybody walked around. We didn't have cars in those days. Everything everything is accessible. Um, by foot um, easily, people bump into each other and um, and collaborate. We need we need a positive vision. Um, I, I'm using up all my time now, so um, I will I will um, 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 just 
just um, I'll just end by saying that that we can choose our future. We can create a vision of the world that we want in the coming decades and then take the steps to achieve it. But first, we must talk honestly about what we face and what our choices are. And that's something that um, our leaders have failed to do at the moment. So let's start the conversation. Thank you. Um, I will. Um, I don't know how to. Sorry, I don't know how to turn that thing off. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Can you see me? We we still see you. OK, um, we will we will help you out. Ah, uh, oh, here we are. Stop oh, sharing. Yeah. Have I done it? Yes. OK. <laughs> well, thank you, um, Gaia, for the for the introductory uh, presentation and and insights into your uh, into your book. Um, I would like to um, open up the the discussion part of um, of the book presentation or the book launch. Um, and uh, with that, I would like can I, to. Can, uh, I just, can I just can I just interrupt? To can I see absolutely. the cover of the book? I'm so excited to see it in Estonian. <laughs> I'm so thrilled. Yes. Honestly, this is yes. so brilliant. I wish that I was there with you today. I don't um, know where I have to show it. Oh yeah. Oh, here. there it is. There. <laughs> you see? Uh, nom nomadi Sayant. Yes. How do I say it? No. How do I Sayant. say that? Sayant. Yes. Oh. You said it very well. It's very beautiful. <laughs> thank you. In fact, I know what a thank you is. Ita. 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 Yes. Ita. 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 Uh, <laughs> we have um, a possibility to um, the, the people in um, in teams. You're more than welcome to send your comments and and questions uh, to our uh, book launch panel um, and so we are happy to to have you uh, in in the discussion with a uh, with us and and also people here um, the the few brave people who've uh, uh, managed to uh, come uh, through the uh, through, 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 through the, the snow, the snow. <laughs> and, uh, the snow. Um, please ask questions as well i would like to um, uh, give a uh, give a floor to uh, our third panelist um jonas plan mm. jonas is um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, jonas is also uh, someone who has been uh, talking about uh, migration uh, lately because of the uh, because of the planet reaching uh, the eight billionth uh, um, uh, person, uh, and and you've been giving interviews. Um, maybe Jonas, well, we'll start with you and and um, ask um, what is your reflection on the book uh, based um, from your perspective uh, as as um, environmental anthropologist uh, who has been doing research on uh, communities who are in um, in a situation where they have to move, um, as an example from Canada? Well, there's there, there are many things, and, and maybe the, one of the most important, what this book brings out is what you also, Kaya said really well, and I believe uh, Canadian author Naomi Klein has uh, coined this, that it's not about climate change, really. It's it's about everything change. And and often when we when we talk about climate change, we immediately think about, as you brought out, droughts, fires, uh, extreme weather events. Uh, but we don't really think how climate change will change everything around us. It will change the socioeconomic dynamics. It will change our cities. It will change the way we are used to live. Not only we as Westerners, uh, fairly wealthy uh, people on this planet, but also people who then have to move. So really everything will be changing. But then the, the problem that we are facing is that often we, again, the, the wealthy uh, part of the world, uh, Westerners, we don't really perceive those changes as those who are forced to then move uh, from those extreme events uh, that, that the weather is, is bringing to them. Um, 
You, you mentioned in, in the beginning, uh, after you showed one slide after another of uh, those horrifying pictures of, of uh, results of climate change, that this is our world. Yes, on one hand, uh, this is our world. This is uh, planet Earth where we live, the, the only planet where we are able to live today. But on the other hand, this is also not our world. For example, we as Estonians, we are living in a world that is much more different than those who are living maybe in Sub-Sahara, those who are living in, in Australia. They are, their world is it's much more different than, than ours, who are probably seeing in the future more longer, warmer summers. Uh, agriculture opportunities will increase for us. Uh, the weather, in a sense, will get better to climate change. And hence, uh, often we as students, we don't think about our world in that sense that uh, people are forced to flee from it, uh, people are, are forced to find another place. We, we, we really must then take this understanding that, that there are different worlds, that uh, there are different um, situations where people are living and, and try to be as empathic as, as possible. Uh, and that for me is, is one of the most important part of this, this book. It really sort of like starts to speak about climate change in, in such a way that we, who will be then those uh, ho host countries, uh, should start to think already today how our world will change, not because of the climate change or not because of the weather change, uh, but due to social economics that, uh, that th those new people will, will bring to us. This is what we need to think about, like how this world where we're living is fairly comfortable, uh, a good life will change if we are going to have much more people here. Uh, and it doesn't uh, uh, it doesn't need to be negative way how it will change that. Yes, isn't it interesting that when we talk about climate change, we talk about the climate, but we don't talk about the people, and we don't sort of pers make make it down to the person level that we on the person level we say how we have to react on the climate change, but how it will change us as human beings. This is something that is sort of quite often neglected in one way or another. Yoko, um, what was the main trigger for you to bring this book uh, to Estonian reader? I think exactly that, uh, that we haven't so far managed to create uh, a good debate. We haven't managed to talk about this uh, processes in Estonia in a way that feels uh, like it's part of our world. I think we have seen it as a part of some other world, you know. And of course, we are in a very fortunate place here. We we have we 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 are from the climate perspective in a very good place. Even though maybe looking outside and having faced the last two days, it doesn't feel like it, but we are. And I think that really. Uh, this shift, like Jonas also explained, this is a very important shift. How to talk about things so that people can actually relate to them. And and maybe from another uh, perspective, we have faced in the last year uh, a totally new situation. We have actually increased our population uh, in a year, in less than a year, by 4%. Uh, this is unprecedented, I would say, for Estonia in the recent uh, 30 years. We have managed to take in almost 100,000 uh, Ukrainian refugees. And finally, this story of migration has become something that we understand, at least f from these people's point of view, because we understand why they have to flee and that this is a better option than being killed. So I think this has also put things into context. And actually, when I try to count a little bit, basing on Gaia's um, book, so what kind of uh, amounts of people would we be facing uh, in the next uh, 10 or 20, 30 years? So I ca actually came to a sum which is very similar to what we have seen now. 
So, so of course, there are places in Europe which are more favorable. There is also Canada, which is one of the countries which I think actually have a vision that Gaia was uh, talking about. They have decided uh, to increase uh, uh, threefold uh, their uh, population. They are a nation based on immigration. They understand the economics behind it. They understand the possibility and they have huge vast lands that actually can become these new cities. Uh, and, and I really, I, I think it is really for me, I, of course, I am an architect by profession. And apart from this sort of uh, difficulty of the political debate, I think it is really interesting what we could do with these new cities. Because actually density gives lots of possibilities. And this is maybe what interests me from, from that point. And, and I see a little bit of a connection I have given out to other books about cities, uh, about how to make cities that are human scale, that are walkable, that are soft cities, resilient to climate change also. And this for me somehow gives a, a new kind of context to this whole need. So from my perspective, these were the reasons to and also so important to read in your mother tongue, you know. Even our language is very small. We most of us speak very good English, but it's different if you if you read it in your mother tongue. Uh, Gaia, a question for you. Um, your book has been very well received uh, by the international audience. Um, what do you think? What is the reason behind that? Uh, people have been sort of waiting your book. Um, well, I, I think I think really, you know, we, we just have not been talking honestly about this. There are a lot of books that are very much about, you know, all the terrible things that will happen with climate change. And, and there are books about how we must change ourselves for climate change, our, you know, our, our um, emissions and so on for climate change. But there aren't there aren't books that really tie together what it means on a population scale as well. Um, you know, if you zoom out and look at the Earth as this, you know, living blue planet with populations of this ape species that are, uh, you know, this human population, you know, which started in the tropics and now has spread everywhere because we are so ingenious. This this idea that when you heat a band, especially along the especially around the tropics, you know, you get migration, you get migration of every species. Um, humans are no different. And and to sort of wake up and accept that and, and really start being pragmatic instead of saying, you know, this is overwhelming problem. There's nothing we can do about it. So let's not talk about it or let's do nothing because there's nothing that makes a difference or just sort of rant and rail um, to sort of to sort of say yes there are things we can do actually at the moment you know we have so many options there are so many solutions i don't expect everybody to agree with all my solutions at all um you know but i've come up with what i think are the best options if you don't agree with them then come up with your own and and let's talk about these options because there are so many things we can do and let's make democratic decisions now while we do have all these choices, rather than, you know, 20 years, the next big crisis, and we have to solve it with emergency actions, and nobody gets to decide, nobody gets to plan. Um, you know, that that's not really the solution I want. And, you know, you were talking earlier about Estonia being a lucky country. It's, it's a super lucky, I mean, you know, Estonia's history is, is so, is so tragic and so upsetting but geographically and climatically it is actually it is actually a lucky country and you know this is this is the century for Estonia now finally you know to to um <laughs> it, you will get longer growing periods you will get you will have enough water you will have you will be able to pick and choose your migrants because you know people will want to come to Estonia um, to build these um, these new cities that Yoko is going to help design, you know, this is like, this is this could be this could be amazing. Um, you know, out of out of tragedy. You know, climate change really is 
it is a threat multiplier. So it comes on top of, you know, everything else. So the people that are hit worst are not just the people that are in um, the most unfortunate places, you know, um, geographically, or living on the tropics or living on coastlines or river deltas. It's people who also are suffering other effects. So they, you know, they're dealing with conflict. They're dealing with um, massive poverty, um, food shortages, um, it's social injustice. Even in rich countries, the people most affected in the United States are the marginalized, the poor black people living in, um, you know, that, that are facing huge social injustice. They're the ones that are affected most. So it's, you know, it's so it's so essential that we build into these new inclusive cities, this this true inclusive um, social justice where people really are considered new Estonians. You know, they're considered new Estonians and they're thought of as that. Um, we if you look at what happened to Sweden, for example, recently, um, Sweden has been very, very generous very generous policy to refugees, taken lots in, but hasn't done that, hasn't invested socially in that inclusive narrative. And so you've had this segregation, you've had this separation where um, immigrants don't feel Swedish and Swedes don't think of them as Swedes. And so you get this, this disconnect and that drives the rise of the far right. It drives, you know, um, poverty, um, a, a sort of a, a black market, not just economically, but socially um, with, you know, all sorts of other issues, um, violence, drugs, etc. You know, we need to learn from that. We really need to learn from that and build social inclusivity. We need to think of ourselves all as the new Estonians, you know, that, that are, that are um, a new society that come from other places, but are invested in this country in building a progressive, productive society. It's so important, I think. Uh, thank you. Let's, <clears throat> let's get political, uh, Yoko. You were, you were hesitant of, um, of publishing the book exactly for the same reasons that uh, Gaia has just um, brought out. Um, you sounded like uh, Donald Trump. Look what happened in Sweden last night. Um, uh, exactly uh, pointing to the the question of migration in um, in Sweden and and its um, its its huge challenges uh, that Sweden is facing today uh, regarding uh, populist parties uh, being in in um, in the government. Uh, Joko, uh, can you open up uh, your concerns a little bit uh, when it comes to publishing the book and, and also now that we are going to have elections quite soon, uh, this opposition towards migration is one of the pressing issues that we have. Mm. Yeah, and I think for me, even, um, even more so actually the the very vague interest uh, in uh, dealing with uh, climate issues. So in a way, uh, I have really struggled with getting the attention to the environment, to the climate issues. And, and we have lots of, uh, like, just say migration and you will get lots of attention. So actually, I was thinking maybe it's possible to somehow um, co-benefit here. Because I think we have come also, I, I have been in politics for quite a long while. I think I have been like uh, disillusioned and, uh, and illusioned and, and finally also decided that actually everyone cannot like you. It's, uh, it's also in a way, um, I see that issues that I have been worrying about and felt like uh, nobody really cares. Actually, they do come and, and they now seem to be coming quicker and quicker. So in a way, it, it also uh, sort of, uh, of course, it is scary, but after, after all, you have to somehow face it. And I think it's, we don't have the option to not talk. I mean, even, even again, Ukraine showed us, I mean, we, we have to deal with it. And actually, migration is happening as we speak already in huge numbers. Of course, most of the migrants are not reaching uh, us. But, but still, some are. And also, actually, Estonian society is already changing. And, and I think there are uh, 
it, politically, I think it's uh, it's still this book won't get that much attention in Estonia. I'm afraid because I think it's it still seems very far away. But I think it's it's even enough if at least uh, we have we I have both of the two biggest universities on board in this project. It's it's great, and it shows me that actually in these circles, people are already seeing the signs they are seeing the need to act and and we need to also somehow help to broaden the view for for a broader public i think so so yes i think it was scary and and i think it will be scary and life in general is very scary so so i think uh, we have to somehow try and do it anyway uh jonas how, what is your perspective on on sort of the, the political um side of um, of um, the the ideas that are presented uh, in the in the book um, regarding migration and and here we we can talk about Estonia yeah in, in, in that sense I think it's it's important that this book now is in Estonia because it, it it really brings that elephant in the room really in front of us we we, we, we must start to think about and talk about migration more loudly. But in the same time, I believe it's 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 fairly dangerous mindset to think that we are able to pick and choose who is coming here. And I think this has been Estonian politics for the last decade that we are trying to pick those uh, highly educated, uh, uh, highly paid uh, workers uh, to come here. But in the same time, there are lots who are left behind, those who have been working on the field, those who are poor. Uh, they will come. We, we we really can't build that fence uh, around our country and, and say we will take only you who uh, is working in in uh, uh, IT sector. IT sector in 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 really really high high salary position. We need to start. And, to and we about and we every country needs this like high high you know high worker as well as the um, low low skilled workers you, we need and that mixture because that's what our society is and it's it you know we it, it it's also quite strange i think when countries say they only want high skilled workers because what are they saying that they want their own nationals just to be low paid workers then of course not you need to bring that mixture in to to build your bigger society otherwise it's um yeah, it's. I always find that logic very bizarre. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely, no, I totally agree with you. It's. It's maybe we should think how to educate our kids uh, to become those high, high, high paid uh, ET sector workers. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and but all all jobs need are needed, to... so all jobs have value. You know, like all jobs are valued, and and at the same time, like if we think about. Uh, the future uh, of Estonia in, in, in the perspective of climate change, saying that agriculture, there will be more opportunities. We also need people who are working on those fields. Not There's not enough anymore Estonians living living rurally. Um, uh, and yeah, picking from that point, um, Gaia has written um, uh, in her book that uh, migration has to be governed uh, instead of being controlled. How can migration be governed? Uh, what is your view, Jonas? Can it really be governed, or um, uh, by controlling? We say that the, this this is the sort of narrative that we've heard from our uh, politicians and our previous president that we can pick the best and mm -hmm. and uh, and um, and make the the sort of the the narrative of smart nation idea happen. Um, how can we govern it? In order to govern, first we have to have political will. Uh, with uh, the Russian war, Ukrainian refugees, we we are seeing that there is political will, and sort of like the we have the capability to 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 govern. We we have the skills, the people, but as long as we kind of like are like politically trying to keep them away, uh, it will be really difficult to 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 govern. So, I I, I believe. We must start with the, with with the mindset. Like, how do we think about people who are coming in here? If politically we make that decision that okay, we're we're going to see in the future in the in the coming century more and more people coming here. Not only those uh, IT sector uh, startup uh, workers, uh, program coders, uh, 
but also people uh, who have worked on, on uh, low salary positions, uh, who have worked in the field. So we must to start to train those officials, uh, uh, social workers, uh, uh, translators, uh, people who are working with them, those people who are coming in here. But it takes really sort of like um, political will. We must make the, choose that, uh, that path. Before I give floor to Yoko, um, I still want to uh, get a bit um, more, get a bit uh, sharper and and ask uh, uh, ask from you, jo uh, Jonas, that uh, you've been working with uh, with um, the the fishing communities in in Canada and uh, and you've seen how how Canada has been governing um, uh, the the migration of of communities uh, is that the way um, of of governing uh, migration is is that something that we can say that uh, is uh, sort of um, a good example or or can you point out any good example of of migration or governing migration in the world, because uh, when we say governing migration, I s keep thinking of the Inuit people uh, who've been sort of colonialized uh, um, and uh, because of the economic uh, sort of migration and so on and so forth. Is there a good example in Canada that you can bring forward from sort of from the community perspective? Uh, as of uh, it's a very unpleasant question. It's, it's, it is no, it, but and there's of course there's no. So universal answer to that: uh, what is what is good? What is good? It depends on the community. It depends on 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 the people who are living. In the case of of uh, fishing communities, the state has created opportunities so that they can basically commute between Canada, and which is uh, also like. Um, sarcastic that uh, mainly they are f migrating from one part of the country to another part of the country to extract uh, oil or, or oil uh, the tar oil so kind of like contributing to, to climate change with that but but it's it's about creating opportunities so that people can always return to their uh, communities but when we are speaking about the indigenous people in Canada Inuits uh, Innus then uh, it's a matter of giving them possibility to, to govern themselves the way they would like to do that. And, and often that's uh, what is needed, that we need to give also power back to those small communities and not uh, always govern it uh, from uh, centrally. So that is maybe um, a good example, better example than the example with, with fishers, where sort of like uh, the state is supporting uh, this, uh, is supporting uh, commuting between uh, two different communities, uh, 2,000 miles apart, uh, contributing more and more to climate change. But then on the, on the other hand, uh, they have given opportunity, they have given a uh, chance to govern themselves uh, for the indigenous people. And and, uh, and this is maybe one way how to how to uh, deal with this. We, we need to give back power to smaller communities who are maybe able to then bring in those, uh, those uh, migrants who are coming in here. Uh, they often know what who they need and, and into which field they need people. Uh, we have one question already from uh, from the audience, Janus. Uh, thanks for the author for a very uh, intriguing book. I just um, following the discussion here. I just wanted to ask. Um, this is a good ga gaslighting book for a kind of our context because. Um, you're coming from the like imperial past where the kind of origin stories of the countries is fairly bit different than uh, national states here kind of in Baltic region in Eastern Europe. So kind of just um, give or have you um, have you seen any hopeful stories about how uh, a nation comes to another nation's territory um, and kind of integrates well, because what you are speaking of is a migration of a, of a grand scale and, and not some people who are coming here as Ukrainians uh, with the hope of getting back to their homeland. It's, it's they are leaving their, their whatever was their homeland and they need to integrate. So 
um, uh, the, in Canada, basically, um, it's it's a very different story. This is a a, a nation of migrants, and here um, the old modus operandi of what Estonia is is like this is our land, <laughs> this is our language, and you know, uh, yeah, it kind of seems very um, intriguing to put it mildly. Yeah. Any good examples? Yeah. Do you have any good examples? Uh, the, well, the I mean, uh, yes. And, and But the thing is, you, you have to also remember how short everybody's memory is, because even when we talk about um, countries that are lands of migrants, whether we're talking about the United States, whether we're talking about Canada, whether we're talking about Australia, these are relatively recently um, created, states created by migrants from all over. And yet, if you talk to people there, particularly in America, particularly in Australia, there is this very strong narrative of our country, our nation, and everybody else coming in as foreigners, um, who kind of, um, you know, they think of themselves essentially as indigenous people. And of course, Estonia, does Estonia still have, um, I know Finland um, in the far north um, has the last sort of, uh, and, and, and Norway and Sweden and parts of Russia have the have the last um, actually indigenous um, populations of Sami um, people. I don't think Estonia does. So, you know, um, every country. We, we are indigenous. That's also one of the narratives that well, we have here. We are I'm indigenous sure. people. Sure. I mean, um, well, if you look at the, the original people from you know, if you look at the genetics, it tells a much more interesting story um, about who is indigenous and who isn't. And we are all mixed up. We are all mixed up. Um, um, you know, the 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 languages of um, Finland, of Estonia, of Hungary are very closely related. And it's thought that they the um, um, original people um came from um, a part of Asia Minor, actually, and um, travelled there. But anyway, the, the point is, um, I'm es escaping that. Um, yes, there are um, cases of people moving and integrating um, in societies which um, which um, are not were not um, empires or whatever. If you look at the Kiribati people, a lot of them have moved to um, either New Zealand or they've moved to um, uh, Fiji or um, other other countries um, around there. If you look at um, um, and that's been that's been um, done in a in a very uh, welcoming way, actually, even though these people don't speak the same language, um, they have different religions and cultures quite often. Um, there, there are cases. What, what we're seeing at the moment is over the next coming decades is going to be a sort of unprecedented movement and it's going to be from multiple different countries. Um, I will quickly go back to the genetics because the genetics tells a really interesting story that there are, you know, we all have common ancestors very, very recently actually. Um, and that's because our our ancestry, however we like to think of ourselves as true Estonians or true Brit British people, true Celts, true um, wherever we come from, there has been enormous amounts of mixing, enormous amounts of mixing, not just of culture, um, not just of food, but of genes, and there. You know, if you look at even the most the, the populations that consider themselves as the purest, I don't know, um, that, that don't that don't intermarry um, some certain Jewish communities, for example, there is enormous amounts of mixing. People have always moved around. And of course they have because tiny isolated gene pools just don't survive. So there is an awful lot of mixture and nobody can claim to be a true native. But the influx of other people, of course, it means change, but change is happening anyway. If we don't change, stasis is death. Um, change happens all the time. You know, um, the Estonia of 1950 is not the same as the Estonia of today, and it will not be the same as the Estonia of 2070. You know, we are all changing, but it doesn't mean that the cultures 
the important cultural um, and uh, traditions and foods and um, songs and poetry of Estonia will be lost. It will still be there. It's just more will come in and you'll get interesting fusions, interesting mixtures. Um, it doesn't mean a loss. It means essentially a gain. And I think that's something that we should we should bear in mind. As long as there are people that um, enjoy and listen and um, and respect and um, and and want to keep those cultures alive, which there will be, of course, they will continue, um, but they will be added to by um, an enrichment, usually a fusion of two of two cultures. So um, it's it's not something to be feared. Um, it rather it rather expands the um, the smorgasbord of offerings. Uh, we have uh, another question from the audience. Uh, pleasure to meet. Uh, and I'm just uh, commenting quickly on this, uh, that in our history classes, it was taught that Estonians are one of the longest uh, stable um, nations in, in Europe. We have been living in, in the same region for about 6,000 years um, and uh, should be probably proud about this. So it will, this narrative that you're sharing here will be pretty interesting to the, cater to the Estonian average audience. Uh, if not to say that the Estonians aren't particularly fond of other people, I mean other Estonians <laughs> as well. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but it is true that the gene pool has been mixed uh, mainly because Estonia has been um, very um, strategically located here, uh, and we have been invaded by all of our neighbours uh, throughout the past uh, thousand years or so. Um, well, exactly. I mean, that that, that alone, you know, um, helps um, mix up. And anyway. Well, we don't have a lot of positive stories uh, to share with uh, other people coming in. And um, and uh, that makes this narrative even more complicated. And that's why Estonian politicians, I believe, have been very careful, if at, at all, raising this topic of uh, immigration. To be honest, it's more uh, kind of uh, silenced rather and um, and uh, our populist party has been very good at uh, using the, these narratives uh, that the Estonians traditionally think of themselves. But I actually wanted to ask about um, Estonia being a lucky country because uh, Estonia is a very flat country and a um, uh, lot of the land has recently in the uh, last few thousand years even in certain areas risen out of the sea um, and um, uh, what's what's your view on the, um, the like ice glaciers uh, melting and and uh, raising sea levels? Because uh, as much as I understand, uh, historically the sea levels have been much higher as well. So we might not have that much luck in the end. Yeah. So there is nowhere that won't be affected by climate change, um, and um, and. Um, that doesn't that doesn't mean that um, the e even if you get longer growing periods, you get um, briefer um, and more mild winters, um, you will still also experience um, extreme. So extreme heat waves, um, um, you will experience more um, droughts. And yes, um, as the I'm, I'm not sure of the um, uh, the um geology of um of estonia but but you will almost certainly lose um coastlines um as as the um so it's like some places i know that um for example the north of scotland iceland places like that are still rebounding from the loss of the um glaciers so they're actually their sea level they're um uh they are rising faster than sea level will keep up so so actually um they they will not suffer from um so much from coastal erosion i'm i'm not sure of um estonia to be honest so i'd i'd need to check um but but certainly they <laughs> we keep keep going <laughs> oh, sorry. So, 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 yeah, so certainly fine. there 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 will be um, extremes, and this this um, isn't this isn't um, um, going to be you know 100% um, wonderful all the time at all. And I don't want to give that impression. But Estonia has 
strong institutions, good governance, is relatively wealthy, and the impacts are much less than, um, you know, relative to places that will experience much higher impacts, have much weaker governance, um, are much poorer, they have um, weak institutions with a lot of corruption, and so they, they, might, they find it much harder to um, to adapt to these changes. So, so in that circumstance, that's what I mean by a much luckier country um, in terms of being able to handle this. And, and just to the point of, and I know that it is a, it is a tricky thing, especially, um, you know, with the history um, that Estonia has with Russia and um, the way Russia is behaving um, at the moment and so on. There, of course, there is a fear um, of this invasion of people and um, and um, seeing it as a threat and um, to this sort of um, integrity of um, of uh, precious, you know, Ukrainian culture and so on. I would say that immigration is very much not it's not an invasion. It's not a secure migration is really not a security issue. It is entirely an economic issue and you know a humanitarian issue, of course, as well. But it's it's mainly actually an economic issue. It's not a security issue. People coming are coming for work um, and to a certain extent for safety, and they want to come where the work is, right? That's where people migrate generally, unless it's a complete disaster and then they're just going to the safest place. But what the idea what I'm trying to propose is that we don't wait until it's a complete disaster and everybody comes on a boat desperate, but we have a sort of managed system where we understand that certain people that, that a large number of people will want to migrate um, over and will need to over the coming decades. And so we put in place programs to manage that. And that includes from the outset planning for these bigger cities, planning for um, um, more, you know, expanded um um uh, societies with programs to um you know to for language programs so that people can um uh, speak and read and write um in estonian so that there are cultural programs so they learn about the history and the society and the governance structures how people vote um you know the political structures of whichever country that they um, are planning to move to so that you know that this works the idea is that this works rather than that it is um, then, then, that then local populations do feel overwhelmed by a sudden influx. That's not the way to manage it. So, um, but it shouldn't be seen as an invasion. It should be seen as an opportunity to expand your country, to make it um, a bigger country, um, because people are coming anyway. <laughs> so, you know how 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 we manage that um, does matter, um, and. You know, Russia, incidentally, is one of the fastest depopulating countries in the world. Um, and even though it's extremely xenophobic, not just the leadership, but a lot of the um, populace is extremely xenophobic, they are having to um, change their um, immigration, not just to um, former former um, USSR um, countries, but but much wider because the, the, you know they they can't economically survive. You know, it's entire cities are on the on the verge of um, sort of collapse because they just don't have enough people. And that's before they started sending people off to, to die. Um, recently, you know, it's, it's like a growing problem. So um, um, everybody needs to tackle that. However populist the narrative is in front of. Um, in front of the people. With the other hand, many politicians are also trying to get people in because, you know, in my country, there aren't enough nurses, there aren't enough um, farm labourers, there aren't enough truck drivers, there aren't enough people working even in hospitality at the moment. I mean, it's a real, it's a real problem. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, how countries deal with this um, over the coming decades while we face these, um, this, this uh, climate change you know, it's a real crisis again, you know, um, it will will define the, the future of many of these countries. Well, we are uh, just about to wrap up uh, our discussion. Joko, you mm -hmm. would like to have some. Yes, words. I think I think definitely the, uh, the the when when reading this book, I think the first emotion is often very um, uh, stressful and very like uh, frightening and also I hear it a little bit from from the first feedback here 
But actually, I must say, if if you, I think this is maybe a little bit also the point of the book is that w when you have read it and you have thought about things, you somehow realize that these processes are already happening. Uh, they uh, the the more we deal with it now, uh, the more. Uh, somehow calm, we have a chance of, of doing this. And, and actually, Gaia, you are absolutely right. Uh, the, the main obstacle for uh, economic development of Estonia at the moment is the lack of workforce. So, so I think it's, uh, uh, it is definitely an issue. And, and like I said, uh, most migrants, which you describe very well also in your book, and it's really important for people to see also that actually most migrants are in their own countries just going to a place a little bit further from where the uh, crisis are or in the neighbor country. So uh, for us, uh, there are mostly possibilities in this equation uh, if we uh, manage to be reasonable about it. But what, what it comes to the uh, political support that Jonas was mentioning, that we need this kind of leadership uh, and also comparing it to the Ukraine issue, uh, it, it is there because the support of the public is there. So I think it's a two-way process, and, and this is partly why uh, books, books are a good tool. It is a book not by a politician, but also by a, a scientist, a writer. So I think it's, that's where we all can contribute, uh, to broaden our views, to, to somehow see that these are real everyday issues, not some kind of... Uh, well, it's, it's, it's not yet at least the end of the world, but it's a possibility to actually continue. Um, I would like to give a final word to uh, Jonas by, by asking that now, so far we've been talking about redefining geographies, redefining national states uh, in, in one way or another. Uh, and it's, it's about the possibilities of uh, having uh, uh, migrants working um, uh, working together with us uh, it's 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 good for the economy but the the most crucial question for me is uh, how do we redefine uh, culture because uh, Estonian state um, is based on on the language and on our on our culture it's the the root of of our identity uh, and the people who will be uh, or who are already uh, on the move, the, no the nomads, uh, they have their own culture. So do you see um, sort of a, um, a way how to redefine um, the perception of culture in one way or another, like we should be perceiving our culture in a, in a, in a different way? Uh, do you see the do you see a chance of of adapting uh, or or living together with different cultures? Because this is, uh, as was brought out before, uh, th this is the most crucial issues uh, issue for us. Um, what is your sort of scenario in terms of like 50 years, 60 years? Uh, are we able to redefine our um, cultural being? Um, in in Estonian context, we we must redefine what is Estonian culture, and and that starts with agreeing that our culture is not static. It has never been so. Like we Estonians, we know really well thousands of years our neighbors have been conquering us, but it's not only that they came here and 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 robbed the land, but they brought their culture, they brought their customs, they brought their education. So so we have seen this 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 like in uh, uh, really rapid change of culture throughout our history and this is also happening today the, the moment we 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 let go saying that we try to preserve hold on on something that is so precious to us uh, the moment we understand it's 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 changing and and we 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 are the ones who are controlling this change i believe that would help us to also think about uh, migration uh, suddenly then this migration or, or people coming with their own culture is not anymore that uh, dangerous. Uh, we don't have any more fear about that. And, 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 uh, and that helps us to also then maybe in 50 years perspective think about our culture as something that is evolving all the time. And that is what culture is all about. It's about uh, change. It's about uh, 
uh, development, uh, involvement, uh, and and uh, that what uh, uh, this this intense migration is also coming to bring to us. It's going to change everything, not only the climate. Well, thank you for uh, the sort of uh, hopeful uh, uh, final words. Unfortunately, our time is up, and uh, and as I understand, you will have another launch in uh, Tartu uh, this um, this afternoon. Um, I would uh, uh, I would like by uh, end, ending our our book launch by thanking um, Gaia that your book that you've written the book. See. Beautiful. So sad. I love it. <laughs> so sad you couldn't come uh, to Estonia this time. Hopefully, uh, there will be a chance um, when the weather conditions are are better. And uh, thank you, everyone who've been joining us. Uh, the book is available here. It will be sold in uh, Apollo and Rafaramat, and uh, most likely also online. Um, and um, with that. Um, Thank you, Gaia. Thank you, everyone listening. And uh, let's keep our mind uh, broad and um, see climate change um, as uh, unfortunately inevitable, but adaption is, is the key. And nomads uh, are our friends. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Gaia, and thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you Helen, for your support. And thank you, Gaia, for joining us. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>